Hi, I'm John Cooper. Um, welcome. I'm happy to be part of this presentation where we're going to review the latest clinical evidence of advanced incision management in high-risk arthroplasty patients. Um, I'm proud to be uh, part of this uh, panel. My uh, co-presenter is Dr. Higuera, who is the Amy and David Crone Family Distinguished Chair uh, in Orthopedic Outcomes um, at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in Florida. And I'm an orthopedic surgeon, associate professor at Columbia University Medical Center uh, in New York City. And the two of us are going to be with you reviewing today's topic. These are our disclosures and of relevance. Uh, uh, both of us do have conflicts uh, that are relevant to this presentation. Program information. Uh, this program is uh, provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, uh, which is an HMP global company. And this program was supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare, uh, the, specifically the Medical Solutions Division. We have three major learning objectives we'd like to cover today. Uh, the first is uh, we're gonna review how risk stratification algorithms can help identify patients who are at risk for superficial surgical site complications uh, following uh, hip and knee arthroplasty. Uh, second, we're gonna explore how leveraging uh, closed incision negative pressure therapy can um, perhaps reduce the risk profile and, uh, and thereby optimize uh, post-operative outcomes. And third, we plan to review the latest clinical evidence demonstrating significantly lower 90-day surgical site complication rates using closed incision negative pressure therapy uh, versus our traditional standard of care. So the, the reason this, you know, to me, this is a, a very relevant topic and, and will always be a very relevant topic is uh, despite all of our advances in uh, hip arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty, you know, we've, we've gone from uh, patients spending weeks in the hospital to now uh, many patients uh, able to leave within a day or, or, or some even on the same day of surgery. Uh, we've improved fixation, we've improved durability, we've improved um, the perioperative care. But one of our biggest challenges that remains is periparasitic joint infection. And um, as we've gotten better at so many other things, uh, this has persisted as a problem and has actually gotten a little bit worse over time. Um, this is a slide that uh, I borrowed from a, a colleague, Dr. Jay Parvizi, which reviews the burden of periparasitic joint infection um, over time uh, from 2001 uh, through 2020. And you can see they collected data here and then projected out uh, over time what this would be. And actually we've exceeded these expectations and, and the burden of periparasitic joint infection uh, and not surprisingly the costs uh, have also gone up uh, tremendously over the years as this is a very costly problem that we, that we need to deal with. For that reason, thinking about and being careful about the surgical site is really important because surgical site complications, a wound that's not healing, uh, an incision that's not closed well or doesn't heal well is one of the biggest uh, modifiable risk factors that we have uh, in our control. Um, these have been linked time and time and time again uh, to predisposing patients to a much higher rate of periparasitic joint infection if there's prolonged drainage or a, a, a small wound dehiscence early on. And unfortunately, these are somewhat common following elective joint arthroplasty. Um, it's not a really well-studied area, uh, surprisingly, actually, especially considering how many arthroplasties we do. Um, but the studies that do look at superficial surgical site complications put the rate of uh, these SSCs somewhere between 5 and 14% of the time, which is, uh, in my experience, uh, spot on. Thankfully, the majority of these get better on their own and don't lead to a joint infection. Uh, but patients who do have these are at a much higher risk than a patient whose incision is closed nicely and heals nicely uh, without uh, prolonged drainage. This is uh, one of the studies that, that looks at the risk of surgical site complications after joint arthroplasty. This is one that I did with a colleague, uh, Jose Rodriguez, uh, a few years ago, where we looked at 650 of our consecutive uh, anterior approach hip arthroplasties. Um, the rate of these wound complications is probably a bit higher um, from the anterior approach than it is from other approaches. Um, but we looked at 650 of our consecutive hips, and we found that in our hands, 
Um, you know, in elective cases, we had just over an 11% rate of these superficial surgical site complications. You know, the majority of these weren't, were not infectious complications. Uh, the majority of these resolved on their own, but about 10% of the ones that we saw, or about 2% overall, needed an early return to the operating room um, to, to deal with that surgical site complication. Not surprisingly, the patients who are at risk for these surgical site complications were those with risk factors that we would commonly think of uh, or worry about, which are obesity, diabetes, and uh, previous open surgery in that area. The costs of these can get you know, quite tremendous uh, very quickly. Um, we all recognize that infection has a big burden on our healthcare economics. Uh, there's a lot of increased post-operative resource utilization that goes into managing patients with uh, surgical site complications. Uh, these patients have to come back to the office for uh, visit after visit after visit. Uh, there's a lot more communication with these patients. Uh, there are hard costs to treating these patients with increased uh, touch points, uh, often visiting nurses coming to their home, uh, increased prescriptions, uh, demand on the healthcare system, readmissions to the emergency room are not uncommon. And when you add these up, uh, the literature supports about a $13,000 overall average cost uh, if a patient gets a superficial surgical site infection. And when they get a deep surgical site infection, uh, that cost can rise uh, significantly uh, to pretty close to $100,000 in, in 2021 um, uh, terms. This is a retrospective study um, and a good one from, uh, from Canada looking at the province of Alberta where they looked at a four year period and they looked at all of the uh, hip and knee claims uh, in this captured system. So a, a really good source of data, uh, all patients getting elected total hip and total knee replacements. And they identified almost 25,000 patients uh, and they looked at the 12 and the 24 month costs uh, for these patients. And this is a Canadian system. So a little different costs than the US system. But I, I think that the important takeaway here is the relative uh, numbers here rather than the absolute numbers. But they were able to break down patients into uh, those who uh, healed uh, uneventfully versus those who got a surgical site infection. And if you look at the 12 month costs for the non-infected versus the infected patients, you can see you know, there's like a five fold increase in the total costs over the first year uh, of these patients. Uh, with the non-infected patients having a, a very straightforward, predictable cost um, for the first year. And the uh, patients who got a surgical site infection are early on, um, you know, markedly higher costs over the first year. And those uh, trends actually increased uh, if you look at the 24 month period. Much of this was related to the hospitalization and the increased length of stay um, expected when dealing with these issues. Here you can see a very short length of stay for an uncomplicated uh, non-infected uh, arthroplasty versus a, a prolonged stay, almost six weeks uh, in the Canadian system with a, um, uh, when there was a surgical site infection. Um, I touched on this, but there are a lot of soft costs uh, when dealing with these that are harder to measure in uh, the economic studies. Uh, definitely when patients have these superficial surgical site complications, they're on a delayed track, we're holding them back, and they're not doing therapy, they're not getting back to work quite as quickly. When they're having to come back to the office every week, when they're having to take pictures of their incision and email it or, or, or submit it into our portal so that we can get back to them, uh, these are not things that promote good patient satisfaction and, uh, and, and clearly things that we want to avoid and patients want to avoid. Um, they, they put a big strain on our teams. Uh, they put a strain on, on my nurse, my nurse practitioner, uh, my office staff, and we all agree it's much easier if we can have patients who don't have to have these surgical site complications. And importantly, they're a big source of increased readmissions and probably the biggest source of increased readmissions. There are a couple of studies that look at why patients are admitted unexpectedly uh, to the ER or to the hospital after elective total hip and, and knee replacement. And they're all the typical things that you would expect like uh, periprosthetic fracture, uh, things like dislocation, things like stiffness after knee replacement, uh, their cardiopulmonary complications. But when you add up the overall risks of readmission, about 50% of the unplanned readmissions come from uh, the surgical site itself. Uh, so draining wounds, um, uh, infected wounds, non-infectious uh, wound complications uh, add up to about 50% of the unplanned readmissions. Uh, this is another study specifically looking at patients after total hip replacement, um, where if you look at the uh, 
surgical site infections, draining wounds, wound dehiscence, wound cellulitis, and wound hematoma, about 48, 49% of the unplanned 90-day readmissions after hip replacement. But even non-infectious wound complications can have difficulty. Here's a good study from Washington University in St. Louis that looks at patients who had a, a specifically non-infectious superficial surgical site complications. So they ruled out the, the surgical site infections. They ruled out the deep parapresthetic joint infections. And they just looked at patients who were readmitted for a non-infectious wound complication um, that did not need to uh, take back to the operating room. And they compared them to a matched group of patients who healed uneventfully. And they found that, that two years later, the patients who had the wound complications uh, had lower overall knee society scores and higher rates of pain compared to the patients who healed uneventfully. So, so there may be something more to these complications than, uh, than we realize. So the focus of today is really how do we prevent these complications? How do we identify patients at risk for these complications? And what can we do differently um, to hopefully, you know, not drop this number to zero, but decrease the number of times we're seeing things like this uh, postoperatively? When we see these kinds of patients walk into our office with comorbidities, uh, elderly, uh, patients who had history of prior wound infection, those with vascular disease, um, those um, who are malnourished, uh, certainly obese patients, diabetic patients, uh, patients in renal failure or liver failure, um, we, we worry about these kinds of patients, uh, immunocompromised patients, those who need aggressive blood thinners. Uh, these are all things that when we, when we see these patients and when we talk to these patients in, in the office, we're already thinking um, and, and hopefully counseling them on um, th that their risks are not quite the same as, uh, as a typical patient, a typical healthy patient undergoing elective joint arthroplasty. At Columbia, at my institution, we um, have integrated a, a preoperative risk calculator where we uh, input a number of different variables, comorbidities, uh, BMI, um, number of previous surgeries that they've had, and we uh, have taken the data from this uh, really well done study. Actually, Dr. Higuera, my, my co-presenter was, uh, was one of the senior authors in this study. But this is a, a, a combined study from uh, the Rothman Group in Philadelphia and the Cleveland Clinic, where they looked at uh, um, dozens and dozens of uh, potential risk factors. And they were able to identify those that predispose patients to joint infection. And when they, uh, uh, made this risk calculator, uh, you can see that um, as a patient's comorbidities and risk went up, their risk of getting a joint infection uh, climbed tremendously. And um, so we've designed this into our risk calculator, taking really uh, their data uh, and their algorithms, and we can input the patient's comorbidities. And that gives us a sense uh, in the office when the patient's in front of us, uh, what their specific risk of a joint infection is. Um, and, you know, after doing this, we went from counseling patients that their risk of a joint infection was like one or 2% on average, uh, to being able to give them a very specific risk for their own, uh, comorbidities. So I can tell a patient who's completely healthy, they might have a, you know, a 0.4, 0.5% risk of a joint infection. Um, but some patients who've had multiple previous open surgeries, uh, those who have a number of, uh, sort of negative predictive risk factors. Their risk of infection, you know, is not one or two percent. It, it might be ten percent. It might be fifteen percent. Some are as high as eighteen uh, percent in kind of the worst case scenario. And this can really help inform conversations and help us do things a little bit differently. So here's an example of that, and we get a, an absolute uh, number for uh, the ultimate risk here. This patient, two to two two point four percent. So that brings us to um, you know things that we can do as as surgical teams, as surgeons. To, to try to minimize the risk of incision complications to, and therefore minimize the risk of superficial and deep surgical site infections. Um, I, I think a lot of this stuff that we, that we see is, is probably preventable from, um, from decisions that we make in the operating room, uh, how we close the incisions. And a lot of it's about the quality uh, of you know, how we handle the tissue. Uh, we don't wanna uh, cause too much trauma to the tissues. Uh, I, I think the closure technique is really important and probably something that, that you know, we overlook more than we should. Um, that's one of the reasons that I try to stay in the cases until the very end so that I can get a very consistent closure uh, with the incision edges well opposed, uh, well aligned so that they're not sort of overlapping each other uh, or uneven um, because those can certainly predispose to, to problems. But I, I think one of, the, one of the big shifts that's happened um, from when I was in training uh, as a resident and fellow uh, 
uh, to where we are now is the change in how we actually manage the dressings post-operatively. Um, when I trained, there was uh, a, a convention where we would put a dry gauze dressing or ABD or, um, or something right on top of the incision, expect it to drain a little bit. And on day one, day two, day three, we, we'd walk around and take off the dry dressing, put a new one right back on. We're taking that clean surgical incision that was just closed. And we took all the great care in the operating room to make sure things were sterile. Uh, and we're exposing that to the hospital, uh, to the patient's bed, <laughs> every once in a while to things in the patient's bed that, that we wouldn't want on the incision, uh, exposing that incision right away. And the post-operative dressings that we're using now, uh, at least uh, I think many people across uh, the country and the world have shifted toward occlusive dressings that can remain in place for a lot longer time. Um, this is one example that you see here on the screen, which is a uh, which is a silver impregnated occlusive dressing that's intended to stay on for days or you know, even a couple of weeks uh, um, in, some, in some practices. Uh, there are also uh, skin glue dressings that, that we use commonly. Um, we published on, on this in hip and knee arthroplasty um, not, not too long ago, um, showing decreased rates of incisional complications with these, and, and they can remain in place three or four weeks. And not surprisingly, the, um, the kinds of dressings that stay in place longer um, are met with higher rates of patient satisfaction. Uh, patients like these, they feel protected with these, they feel like something's protecting the incision. They also like them because these are waterproof dressings and they can get them wet. Uh, so I let my patients shower with these more advanced dressings almost right away, um, you know, on, on day zero or day one. Our standard of care at Columbia shifted um, years ago from gauze to, to occlusive dressings uh, um, and this is our early experience with this, where you can see our infection rate um, when we switch to this, this silver impregnated hydrofiber occlusive dressing uh, called the Aquacell AG, the infection rates dropped from 1.6% uh, on average um, down to uh, under 0.4%. So a big shift um, by going from changing that dressing every day to one that just stays in place. And with this, you know, I, I think we made a, a a lot of progress, and this still works well for the majority of patients, uh, but, I, but I do have in my practice a consistent difficulty with the higher risk patients um, having trouble even with these more advanced wound dressings. Uh, you know, those with multiple risk factors, as we've talked about, those with, um, you know, those with diabetes, obesity, immunosuppression, uh, when, when you start lumping those things together, um, even with the silver impregnated hydrofiber dressings, we were still having some, some consistent issues in those patients. And that's where um, I found closed incision negative pressure therapy to be quite handy. You know, that, that worked really well for the majority of patients, but the high risk patients are the ones that I continue to have issues with. And that's where I found uh, utility with uh, closed incision negative pressure therapy, which we're gonna talk about uh, next. And this closed incision negative pressure therapy system or, or the concept of it uh, is not a new concept. This has been introduced in the orthopedic trauma literature uh, going back about 15 years. Um, and these incisional vacs as they were initially designed were specifically done to uh, provide a clean and dry wound environment in the immediate post-operative period to primarily closed incisions uh, and specifically to areas that have a high rate of wound complications. So uh, certain high-risk lower extremity trauma uh, injuries um, um, got these at many level one trauma centers. And now these have certainly evolved since they were introduced in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, the Provena dressing, uh, this specific closed incision negative pressure dressing is about 10 years old uh, on the market. Uh, and this goes back to that concept of the incisional vacs that we would sort of cut in the operating room and make in place over the closed incision. And based on a number of uh, bench top and laboratory and animal studies, the design and delivery of this, um, of this closed system was optimized uh, such that it can be easily applied in the operating room, such that it can deliver a very consistent uh, negative pressure therapy to the closed surgical incision. And most importantly, so that it can be portable and the patient does not necessarily need to sit in the hospital to get negative pressure, but they can actually go home and have that negative pressure at home for, for a number of days once they've been discharged. There, um, 
some good scientific uh, evidence uh, to, to support the mechanism of action of this. And I want to go through this briefly. Um, there are a number of different mechanisms where negative pressure therapy over a closed incision, and specifically this Provena device, uh, is different than a standard occlusive dressing. Um, you know, it provides the same kind of physical protection of the wound as an occlusive dressing does. Uh, but in addition to providing that protection from the outside world, the negative pressure with this device actually is able to draw the incision together and provide a decreased tension or shear at the interface um, of, of where the incision is closed. So there's less tension of the wound pulling apart. There's less shear uh, back and forth because it's a stabilizing type of a dressing. Um, it increases perfusion to the skin edges, reduces the edema um, uh, underneath the skin, uh, and therefore is able to reduce the size of subcut any subcutaneous seroma or hematoma that might develop. Now that's been shown well in a, in a couple of animal models and in a couple of uh, prospective randomized uh, human studies as well out of Europe. Um, there have been some good animal studies that demonstrate an increased uh, lymphatic flow underneath the negative pressure dressing. Um, and these translate in animal models to some increases in uh, mechanical properties or improvements in the mechanical properties of the incision uh, at six weeks uh, compared to incisions that were just treated with a dry dressing. This is uh, one of the good benchtop uh, models that shows what happens when this open cell reticulated foam dressing is applied to a closed incision. Here, the incision is drawn down. It's also drawn in uh, when negative pressure is applied. And what happens when that mechanical suctioning down of that sponge happens is the skin is drawn tighter together and in greater um, apposition to itself. And what that does is it increases the force that's required to sort of pull at that incision. And here you can see in the graph that when negative pressure is applied, the force required to stretch that incision apart increases by about 50%. So this is really helping to stabilize that incision against itself. And this stabilization effect is directly related to how wide that dressing is. So the wider the dressing, the better stabilization it is. And that's one of the reasons that the Provena uh, dressings that we see, you know, are, are a few inches wide. They're not just a narrow strip right over the surgical site itself. This is what happens when you have a negative pressure dressing that's able to draw down and draw in, is you get this splinting effect in the skin. Um, this is a patient that came to me with uh, a BMI in the 50s with a, uh, an acute early postoperative joint infection that had developed because her incision didn't heal initially. So I did a one-stage exchange on her uh, a few weeks out from surgery, uh, took out her cementless parts, uh, put in new cementless components, closed her, and instead of using a, just an occlusive dressing on her, we use this negative pressure dressing and you can see what a stabiliz uh, stabilizing effect it has on these folds uh, underneath her panis. So as she sort of sits up in, in her chair and, and gets up to walk and moves back and forth, that incision is less likely to wanna pull apart and develop a dehiscence as it did the first time. I mentioned the increase in perfusion that happens with these, uh, with these devices. Uh, not surprisingly, when you apply negative pressure to the skin surface, the um, the blood flow to that area increases. So this is certainly helpful in patients with impaired microvascular uh, flow, like smokers, like diabetics, uh, those who need that increased vascularity to the incision edges to help promote uh, good, healthy healing. Uh, this is a good animal model that shows uh, what happens when negative pressure is applied on top of a closed incision. In this model, um, the investigators actually scooped out a portion of the subcutaneous tissue just below the incision, and they cr intentionally created a pocket of dead space where fluid could accumulate inside. And when they did that, um, they were able to measure how much fluid that actually accumulate inside that dead space. And so they closed um, these incisions identically. They dressed one with a Provena dressing, they dressed the other with a dry dressing, and then were able to measure the amount of fluid and they demonstrated quite clearly that the fluid underneath the Provena dressing uh, was a lot less than that under the dry dressing. And it wasn't because the fluid was being sucked out through the incision into the sponge and into the canister. Um, something about the negative pressure being on the skin surface was keeping fluid from accumulating uh, in that potential dead space like it would under a dry dressing. So they went back and designed another experiment where before closing 
they sprinkled in some radio tagged nanospheres that were tagged with different radioisotopes. So these little nanospheres that were 30 microns, 90 microns big, um, were small enough to be able to be taken up by the lymphatic system and, and taken uh, uh, through the body. And then they could be tracked to see where this fluid that was building under the surgical site was going. And when they did this, they found that the radiotag nanospheres that were placed specifically under the Provena dressings were migrating away from the surgical site and into the central lymphatic system at a higher rate, at a faster rate than those um, radiotag isotopes that were under the dry dressings alone. And they concluded from that, that the application of negative pressure on the skin surface over the closed incision was doing something to either open up or activate the lymphatic flow channels uh, in this porcine model and cause fluid egress away from the surgical site uh, to the central uh, lymphatic return. Again, this was confirmed in a, a couple of clinical randomized controlled trials in patients getting hip arthroplasty surgeries. Uh, this is one after a posterior approach elective total hip uh, done in Europe, where 90% of patients with a dry dressing would have a small subcutaneous seroma or hematoma. But those under a negative pressure dressing, uh, a smaller, uh, less than half of the patients had a, a subcutaneous seroma or hematoma as detected by ultrasound. Uh, in addition, in those who had one, the volume of fluid that collected in that, in that dead space was, was lower when there was a negative pressure dressing placed on top. This animal model looks at the return of mechanical properties that happens over time. Uh, so in this experiment, uh, incisions were closed identically, uh, dressing was placed for five days and then removed, and the animals were left alone to heal for six weeks. And at six weeks, the investigators took skin samples from normal skin, from the area where the dry dressing had been used, and from the area where the negative pressure provena dressing had been used. And they did mechanical testing on these skin samples. And they found that in the areas that were treated with a negative pressure of Provena dressing, there was an earlier return or more normal uh, um, return of mechanical properties compared to the standard of care dry dressing. So at six weeks, the mechanical properties of the skin that was dressed for the first five days with a Provena wasn't normal, but it was closer to normal than that uh, treated with a dry dressing. In addition, these had narrower zones of scar uh, when examined histologically. Uh, you can see here, especially in the deep dermis, uh, there's a narrower zone of scar, probably because there's less pulling apart uh, of those incision edges um, as the negative pressure device is stabilizing it uh, against itself. And what this translates into is, is exactly kind of the same things that, that we see clinically when we use these in patients is that, um, a dry dressing um, just has a very different appearance from a negative pressure dressing after five, six, seven days um, in place. Um, this is a porcine example showing identical incisions, identical operations, identical closures, uh, but just different dressings. And you can see that that treated with an ABD dry dressing is a healthy looking non-infected incision, uh, but it's got a, a, a lot more swelling uh, with actually puckering of the uh, of the sutures compared to that treaty with a, a negative pressure Provena dressing, where um, there appears to be more mature epithelialization, uh, a lot less swelling there, um, and sutures probably could come out at five days, whereas I would be concerned about taking them out at five days in, in the picture on the left side of the screen. So to summarize this, there's an immediate impact from negative pressure dressings when they're first placed. Uh, where you get that barrier occlusive function, but you also get stabilization, uh, increased perfusion, and a normalized um, uh, stress distribution. Um, you've got an intermediate term impact over the first uh, five, six, seven days while this is on, where there's less swelling, less edema, uh, a lower risk of a subcutaneous seroma or hematoma, and then activation of the lymphatic system as seen in animal models. Uh, and then longer term, once the dressing comes off, um, there seems to be an early return of, of mechanical strength to these incisions and uh, some, some changes in histology with narrower scarring, um, especially in the, in the deeper dermal layers. So how does this translate clinically? Um, and, and I wanted to focus specifically on, on the risk stratification part of this um, because I think that's, that's where this holds the most value. 
you know, although I'd love to use this in all my patients, I, I don't think it's economically feasible. So uh, what we've done at Columbia is we've, we've really kind of picked those higher risk patients that we've identified, you know, those were, were more worried about uh, difficulties with healing, uh, those that were more worried about high risks of infection, and those are the ones that we're focused on. Um, Dr. Higuera is going to talk about uh, some of those patients in his segment with uh, undergoing hip and knee revision, um, but I wanted to focus on uh, patients undergoing primary arthroplasty. Um, this is the, certainly the, the much more common uh, uh, type of operation that most of us perform, and uh, we designed a, a retrospective study to try to identify those patients who would be most at risk uh, for this. So, and we ended up publishing this in Arthroplasty Today just over, just over two years ago. So we went back to all these potential risk factors that, that could predispose patients to, um, to surgical site complications. And we uh, examined a large um, cohort of our retrospective data, and we were able to develop specifically for surgical site complications a weighted risk stratification algorithm where we we're able to assign points for um, BMI, uh, those who were undernourished or overnourished, uh, diabetics, those who had immunodeficiency, those who were smokers, those who needed aggressive anticoagulation, you know, more than aspirin, and those who'd had previous surgery. And what we found is that when a patient had a risk score of two points or greater, according to this risk stratification algorithm, that their risk of, an, uh, of a complication uh, increased um, significantly. Starting in 2017, I began prospectively applying this risk stratification algorithm and looked at my first 320 patients where I was prospectively doing this. And we were able to uh, stratify my patients into a lower risk sort of healthy group and a higher risk group that had a, a risk score of two or greater. And um, you can see the risk score in the lowest group was 0 0.8. The risk score in the high risk group was 2.3. Um, these were about two thirds of my patients were healthy. About a third of my patients were, uh, were considered high risk. And I used this algorithm to inform which dressing I was going to choose. Um, at this time, I wasn't doing anything else different for the high risk group. So it, it was really the same operation, the same prophylaxis, the same protocols, but different dressings. And when I did that change in dressing for that high risk cohort, we found that the risk of superficial surgical site complications was, was statistically the same um, uh, between the groups. P-value 0.8, uh, both right around 7%. And um, what I took this to mean is that you could take a group of patients who were historically at a higher risk of wound complications, do everything else the same, but just change the dressing. And you could take that higher risk and normalize that risk to what you would see with a standard dressing in a healthy patient. Um, we took this one step further and we looked back um, and compared sort of our current experience where we were risk stratifying with our historical experience uh, before. And historically we had a 12% rate of wound complication you know, across all comers. And this was a time where we were using the same dressing for all patients, we weren't risk stratifying. When we compared our historical 12% rate uh, to what we were seeing after we began risk stratifying, obviously we, we got a lot better. Um, it was statistically significant improvement uh, from 12% down to 7% uh, rate of wound complication rate. And uh, to me, that was meaningful, but I think a very fair um, concern with comparing two different time points is, you know, even if nothing else consciously changed between 2012 and 2017, um, did some other things change that are, we're not accounting for in this kind of study methodology to lead to these in improvements in uh, risk of surgical site complication. So we went back and we divided these patients into high risk and low risk groups. And in 2012, 2013, we were using the same dressing for, for both the high risk and low risk groups. So we weren't um, separating them then but when we retrospectively separated them into high risk and low risk groups, um, we compare the changes in the high risk group and the low risk group individually. And you can see in the low risk group, uh, kind of the healthy patients, historically our rate of wound complication was a little bit higher uh, than it was uh, in, the, in the 2017 to 2018 period, but it was not statistically different. Um, went from 8% to 6%, to 6 but that was not a statistically significant drop. The, the big change came in that high risk group where we didn't think we were doing anything different other than changing the dressing, 
And that uh, led to a huge difference in the rate of risk, uh, the risk of wound complications from 26% uh, down to 7%. And this really confirmed what we were thinking that, um, that you know, doing the operation, the same, same uh, kind of indications, uh, but simply changing the dressing at the end of the case could take the risk of superficial surgical site complications in a high risk group and basically normalize that to what you would expect in a healthier group. And with that, I'd like to, to turn it over to Dr. Higuera, who's going to continue these thoughts as he talks about even higher risk groups of patients undergoing revision surgery. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. I am going to present a study, decreased 90 day surgical site complication rates with closed incision negative pressure therapy after revision, knee arthroplasty, a randomized trial. I want to acknowledge all the institutions and centers that participate in the study, in addition to acknowledge my co-author. So we know that revision total knee arthroplasty has almost 15-fold increase in positive complication rates when compared to primary procedures. So we need a lot of um, strategies to try to mitigate this surgical site complication. We have multiple reports that have where there is an assessment of e efficacy of negative uh, incisional pressure that has been unfortunately retrospectively or for the most part reporting a heterogeneous cohorts, revisions of hip and knee arthroplasty. Uh, the standard of care intervention have been inconsistent. And most of these reports have small sample sizes, like 15 to 80 uh, patients, or even the smaller cohorts. We actually published one of this a um, couple of years ago. But again, it was a mix of hips and knees. So that really led us to the development of this prospective randomized uh, trial that hasn't really been done and in order to try to get level one data. So we wanted to see if the Provena incision management system, after the new indication of being clear by the FDA, to reduce seromas and superficial surgical site infection in class one and two wounds in high risk patients had an effect after revision total knee arthroplasty. It is important to highlight that this technology has some limitations and uh, shouldn't be used to treat surgical site infections or seromas or use in pediatric population or being used in class three and class four contaminated or dirty infected wounds for treatment. So the aims of the trial, number one was to evaluate the efficacy of closed incision negative pressure therapy versus silver impregnated standard of care dressing to mitigate 90 day surgical site complication rates to investigate the effect of this technology versus the standard of care or the silver impregnated standard uh, dressing in healthcare utilization parameters after revision total knee arthroplasty. And finally, we wanted to see if there was an effect on patient reported outcomes comparing these two interventions. We designed a prospective multicenter post-market open-label randomized clinical trials. And the inclusion criteria included patients older than 22 years of age, patients that underwent revision total knee arthroplasty between December 2017 to August 2019, including one stage aseptic revision or septic exchange, removal of cement spacer, and reimplantation, and finally, open reduction and internal fixation of prosthetic fractures. And patients had to have at least one or more high-risk criteria to develop surgical site complications. This um, high-risk criteria included 
a higher BMI than 35 kilograms per meter square. Usage of anticoagulants or antiplatelets other than aspirin. Current or previous diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease. Current tobacco use. Operative lymph lymphedema. Use of immunomodulators, steroids, or a current diagnosis of HIV. History of malignancy uh, within five years of the procedure. Rheumatoid arthritis renal failure or patient and dialysis, malnutrition, liver disease, organ transplant, insulin-dependent diabetes, or prior infection of the operative site. And this is the distribution of those comorbidities in our uh, cohort, being obesity and diabetics, the, the main uh, risk factors that were present in our subjects. The exclusion criteria including pregnant or lactating uh, patients, need for revision within 30 days of a stage bilateral total knee arthroplasty, uh, remote skin infection or active systemic infection at the time of the surgery, patient had tattoos within 30 days of the revision, the skin cancer at the incision site, hypersensitivity to the study components, surgical wound requiring muscle flaps or those that precluded dressing placement and the use of surgical glue for wound closure. And again, the intervention was in the study group, the negative pressure wound therapy. And in the control group was the standard of care was basically a commercially available silver impregnated dressing like an aquacell. And the duration of treatment was at least five days for both arms from the index procedure. Patients were randomized using a centralized electronic web-based algorithm. Uh, it was an IBM clinical development application in a one-on-one -on -one basis. In the operating room after conclusion of the revision procedure and wound closure to mitigate bias. And the outcomes that we measure was any occurrence of 90-day surgical site complication as the primary outcome and additional or exploratory outcomes included surgical site infection in 90 days, deep surgical site infection in 90 days, surgical site complications at 30 and 40 days, readmissions and reoperations within 90 days, length of stay and number of dressing changes, number of clinic home health and rehab and physical therapy visits within 90 days. And we measure pain and function using PROMISE and CUS scores as a patient reported outcomes. And this is our enrollment and randomization flow. You can see we assess for eligibility and were consented about 364 patients after exclusions. We had 294 patients, 147 patients in each arm. They were allocated and then uh, we lost some follow-up, small, but some what significant. And we ended up having about 118 patients, which is more than 80% follow-up, at least in 90 days, for final analysis. It's important to understand that we, to have validity, we wanted, we were planning to have 440 patients, uh, to have enough power uh, with an intention to treat analysis of about 147 per arm that we did because when we did interim analysis, we found that there was a significant difference in the study group versus the control group. And it was a clear difference on the decrease of complications. And for that reason, we stopped at 147 uh, patients per arm. These were our population characteristics. So 90 day follow-up that completed was um, about 124 patients in the study group and 118 patients in the control group. This is the average age, about 65 years. The majority of patients, 60% were females. And the distribution between septic and aseptic, we found that about 
equally in both groups were septic revisions. And the randomization was successful to eliminate any significant baseline difference in terms of demographics, BMI, smoking status, any comorbidities, uh, preoperative diagnosis, the type of revision, including septic or aseptic, the method of closure, and the treatment duration. And these were our results. At 90 days, there was a significant difference in terms of the surgical site complications between the study group and the control group. The control group have almost a 14% incidence of surgical site complications versus 3.4% in the study group. And that was statistically significant. Now, when we look at individual surgical site complications, like superficial surgical site infection versus deep, uh, the hissancy, seromas, kidney necrosis, or continuous drainage, despite the fact that we can see some trends, as you can see here in our numbers, they were not statistically significant. However, when we look at the 90-day surgical site complication in the aseptic population, was a clear difference. It was 1.8% uh, in the study group versus 14% in the control group. And the same was true in the septic population. It was a clear trend, 10% versus uh, almost 18%. However, that was not as statistically significant as you can see uh, down here. Now, when we look at the additional outcomes the, in the study group, there was a clear difference at 30 and 45 days incidence of surgical site complications, 90 day readmission rates, and the length of stay was lower as well. And when we look at the details, it was almost at 30 and 45 days, it was about 3% versus 12 and 14% in the control group, respectively. The readmission was 3.4% in the study group versus 10% in the control group. The length of stay was significantly different, almost by uh, four days. However, there was no difference in the number of clinic visits, uh, home health visits, number of rehab or physical therapy visits, 90-day reoperation was despite the fact that there was a clear trend, uh, difference was not statistically significant. And also the number of dressing changes was less in the study group than in the control group. When we look at the patient reported outcomes, both coups and promise in terms of pain and function, there was an improvement in both group after the surgery, and there was not a statistically significant difference between groups. They did an equivalent improvement. In terms of safety, in the study group, we have a less number of dressing changes, as you can see in our numbers. And then we will look at the treatment emerging adverse events. Uh, there was not a significant difference we have one death in the study group that was unrelated to the procedure. There are some limitations in this study in terms of there is no blinding of outcome evaluation. Also, there was a limited sample size due to the premature discontinuation of the study where we found a significant difference in the primary outcome and it was definitely not ethical to continue with the study given the fact that we found a clear benefit in the study group compared to the control group and we have some loss of a follow-up in both groups but this was not really significant we had more than 80 percent follow-up at 90 days but overall in conclusion we can affirm that this type of technology after revision total knee arthroplasty in high-risk patients is very effective in decreasing 90-day surgical site complications and readmissions and the number of dressing changes. This can have significant implications as the cost of these revisions have been increasing and unfortunately some of the reimbursement 
has been decreasing in the economics of revision surgery, this can be a game changer. We also talk about length of stay and how length of stay is a main driver of cost. There's a significant difference in the length of stay when we use these type of technologies. I anecdotally can tell you that, at least in my institution, when we look at the cost of this technology and we did a quick analysis to evaluate the potential savings of when we use this technology, we can easily save two or three days in the length of stay and that outpays the cost of the technology. Usually we use just use a regular incisional vac not a Provena product, you will need authorization by insurance. It's a lot of paperwork, not to mention the fact that you need to wait for the equipment, and that usually takes one or two days. So you can easily save a significant amount of time when you use this type of technology. Some common questions uh, that we get are about uh, the learning curve of applying this uh, dressings and it's relatively simple uh, de definitely there is a learning curve uh, for uh, especially the knee it has to be and a little bit of flexion I usually put the the knee between 30 uh, to 20 degrees of flexion before I apply it so when the patient start doing range of motion and things like that it's not going to put too much pressure on the skin that can potentially lead to blisters. That is important. Uh, also, it is important to educate the patient about how to manage the device. Um, sometimes, especially at the beginning, we lost some of the pressure because we didn't apply the device appropriately and then the patient ended up back in the emergency department so it's very important just to clean all the area, being sure that uh, the device is working well um, before a patient goes home. And, and also educate the patient about uh, how to carry the device, be sure that they are not going to pull the device from the uh, dressing that will result in an unnecessary uh, ED visit or clinic visit to uh, change the dressing. One common issue uh, with this uh, type of dressing is that the patient will have to come back um, at seven days after the application. And some of these patients live far away and sometimes can be cumbersome. So I think it is important to have this discussion with the patient. I truly see the benefit of the technology. So it's definitely worth um, having it and then coming back. However, I have a fair amount of patients that come from three, four hours away uh, driving. So one thing that we have been doing uh, with this is telemedicine and virtual visits. And we basically, I mean, it's very easy to remove. So uh, we have a little sheet that we give to the patient with some of the instructions and Sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating, especially for uh, if there are some home health, like nurses, or even for the family members. But it's very simple. Simply, you just have to turn it off, uh, unplug the uh, hose from the pump, and then very carefully just detach the uh, adhesive from the skin and then after just do a clean up. And then those patients, we actually give them an additional regular dressing that they can use after they remove the incision of back. That way, give them at least another one or two weeks before they have to travel back to, for follow-up. Obviously, if the patients have an issue, then uh, we want to see them sooner rather than later, but that can help you uh, minimize some of these follow-ups. And over time, we haven't had any issues. Uh, actually, a lot of patients prefer to do that rather than driving back uh, three or five hours 
to uh, see us again. And with that, I will conclude my uh, presentation. And thank you very much for your participation.